We are here in our Advent series. This is the inaugural Advent series of the life of our church. Um, by God's grace, man, we are able to actually do this. And, and here, if you're new to the church or if this is not um, something you're familiar with, you kind of heard it, just briefly, Advent is the four Sundays that the church historically marks off to observe the birth of Christ. It's a season that is cultivating this, for us to slow down and to cultivate longing. It's, it's, it's this way where we live in this tension and it's an invitation to invite us to feel the brokenness of this world while simultaneously at the same time to feel the hope that Christ has, uh, that, that we have in Christ. One, that he came, but also that he will come again. And so that's what we do in this, this season here. And so what we're going to do is we have, um, there's this favorite song called, that many of us know, called Joy to the World, right? And in that, in that song, Joy to the World, there is a line that says, that speaks to kind of this moment. Because, yes, Advent is longing and it's lamenting and you feel the brokenness, but it's also joy, and it's a line that says, he's come to make his blessings flow as far as the curse is found. And so this is a season that we are, uh, that's going to title our series is as far as the curse is found, we see how heaven broke into humanity to give us hope and to give us hope. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to spend um, some time looking at kind of the, 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 the narrative and the arc stories throughout the Bible. And today we'll look at lament, and next week we'll look at promise, and we'll look at the hope, and then we'll look at the gift um, on, on the 24th as well. And so we're just, again, this is a season for us to embrace and to feel the tension as we live in the already and not yet. And so what I want to do is I would like to have Carla to come up, please. And she's going to let each Sunday, each Sunday we'll have someone light a candle and these candles, and you can go ahead and do that while I'm speaking. You'll have to wait. Um, it is again, the candles represent hope, peace, love, joy. And again, it's just a reminder of what this season is for us, how we have true hope, true peace, true joy and love. But before we do, what we're gonna talk about is that we're gonna talk about lament because in order for there to be good news, there is somewhat has to be some bad news. Um, but I believe that this text invites us into some beautiful things today. And so if you would have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter five, Romans chapter five, and I will pick up at verse 12, Romans chapter five, picking up at verse 12. I hear the page flipping, which is beautiful. Here reads the word of the Lord. I'm going to read verses 12 through 19 in its entirety. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam who was a type of the one to come. But the free gift, namely Christ, the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. For judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespass brought justification. For if because one man's transgress, uh, trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness led to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedient, the many were made sinners, and so by the one man's obedience, 
many will be made righteous. May the Lord have a blessing to the readers, the hearers, but most of all, the doers of his word. Father, we come now desperately needing you in this moment. May your words speak. May your words bring life to our hearts. Where we feel resistant, may we lay them. May we, may we approach you. Even if there's some apprehension, may we still approach you right now. May you bring transformation. May you do what no man can do. Bring life from dead places. Heal, redeem, restore the brokenness of the soul. Don't have me look, be looked as an entertainer, but one who stands behind the cross, proclaiming, thus says the Lord. And so let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And we all together said, amen, amen. amen. Winter is here. Winter is here. But spring is coming. There's a book, there's a book in a movie called The Chronicles of Narnia and winter has plagued Narnia. And there's a desire for those who live in Narnia to experience winter. I mean, excuse me, to experience spring. And the reality of it is, is winter is not how things are supposed to be. And the, in the correlation, if we're honest here today, when we look at our life, it doesn't take far for us to look to know that life is not what is to be. And there's a longing that we have, this desire to be able to, if I could say, to see spring again, to see life as it should be. But we lament that, we, we grieve that. That's what lament is, this grieving, this embracing sorrow because of what I am seeing, something isn't quite right. You feel the emptiness. I love how uh, Dr. Su Chan Ra, he talks about lament. Look at this with me, read it along. It says, lament in the Bible is a liturgical response to the reality of suffering and engages, here it is, engages God in the context of pain and trouble. Lament is the, is the, in the Bible is a liturgical response to the reality of suffering and engage. Don't miss this. Engage God in the context of pain and trouble. But if we are honest, we don't engage God. In fact, we don't want to face the truth. If we can be honest, here's the thing. In order to properly lament, it requires an honesty, not a denial of truth. But we want to deny the truth because we live in a world that is all about triumphalism and progressing up to the right. We want to celebrate life. We don't want to sit in that pain. We don't want to sit here and, 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 and acknowledge that. So what do we do? We deny the realities of things. We live in denial of our problems and the problems around the world, but also the problems within us. And so we mask the pain we sit here and create false realities. We don't want to embrace and pinpoint where the pain is. In fact, what we would rather do is to run to something that gives us a satisfaction that thinks that will soothe the pain all the while it leaves us empty. And when we know that there is something there, we try to create this capacity to fix the solution all the while realizing our solution doesn't have the capacity to reach the problems. We want to live in false realities. But how many of you know the Bible, though? The Bible gives us a glimpse of the full truth in both ways. One, it gives us the full glimpse of our brokenness. It's honest as it can be. The Bible causes us to lament that, to, uh, to be honest with that. The Bible says that if we say that we are out sin, we make ourselves a liar. God is not in us. There is no light in him. So the Bible gives us a full glimpse of our brokenness, but praise God, hallelujah, it gives us, this, it gives us a full glimpse of our all-sufficient, all-encompassing solution, namely in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible gives us today. But let me say this here. 
Who wants, who, who wants to be healed? Who wants to be healed? I don't know anybody, believer, non-believer, that does not want to be healed. You know what needs to be healed in your life. You know what you experience. You know what needs to be healed in your families. But let me say this here, and this is an honest truth here. You and I will never, never receive the healing that we desperately long for until we understand and until we tell the truth about the source and depth of our problems. We cannot keep living in denial. Let me say that again for us. If you want, many of, if you want to receive the healing that you and I so desperately long for, desperately need, we have to understand and you have to tell the truth. You hear that? Somebody say, tell the truth. Tell the truth about the source. And get this, the source and the depth of your problem. Do you want to be healed? Today, we're going to look at three questions surrounding the problem. Three questions surrounding the problem that will help us to see this problem and understand this problem and actually embrace limit, uh, um, the, the lamenting that, that, that properly should be called for. One, three questions. I'm going to give you a front and we'll walk our way through the text. First question is, where did the problem come from? Where did the problem come from? How far did the problem reach? And how is the problem dealt with? Where did the problem come from? How far does the problem reach? And how is the problem dealt with? Family of God, if you want to be healed, be honest with the source and depth of your pain of your problems. The first movement, we see the first question, where does the problem come from? You know, narratives matter. How we tell narratives, how we see narratives. And and in fact, um, they matter because what we believe has everything to do with how we see the problem and what we offer as a solution. Let me say that again. We believe, what we believe has everything to do with how we see the problem and what we can offer here. But understand, in some of that actually attached to how we see the creation story. What we see that the Bible in the beginning in Genesis, there was nothing, but yet the spirit was present, the triune God living in perfect harmony. And God looked at nothing, stepped out at nothing, held nothing in his hand and spoke into nothing. And beauty came around. You had noise, colors, sound, sight. And he looked at everything and said it was good and very good. And then he, in, 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 the, in the climax of all, that was when he created humanity, gave them rule and dominion over all of God's beauty. If I could use one word that the Bible dictionary talks about to describe this, it's called shalom. Shalom, look what Cornelius Plantica says about Shalom. It says in the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness and delight, a rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and and natural gifts fully employed. A state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as the creator and savior opens doors and speaks welcome to the creation in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way things are supposed to be. But how many of you all know Shalom got vandalized? It became counterfeit. What do you see this, Pastor? You look at verse 12, it says, just as sin came into the world through one man, death reigned through sin. What we have here is that Adam and Eve decided to rebel against the creator. They thought that what they should do would be more important than actually obeying his word obeying what he says and understand we realize that shalom is off. Why do we know that? Look around us, look in your neighborhood, 
Look in your communities. Look on your job. Look in our your country. Look in the world. But here's one. Look within yourself. You know something's off. Shalom is off. There's an inconsistency with it. Why? Because sin entered through one man, namely Adam. When we talk about sin, understand this. Sin is, is this general term, but it's personified. Sin is personified as this devastation that came and plagued and it reigns over unbelievers, but sin also is persistent in the believer. It continues to chase after us. It's a reminder how oftentimes if you are a believer, you once used to be a slave to it and it wants you back. And we know that sin is active because if you keep reading Romans, uh, the next several chapters, you see that sin reigns, sin is active, it seizes opportunity. And really the idea of sin is that it's missed a mark. There's a goal. There was a goal there and it's been missed. And what has been missed? A failure to obey and honor, love God and honor others. And sin is more than just doing good or bad. It actually is this illusion that we create in our minds to convince ourselves that what we're doing is bad is actually good because we would rather be in authority than God be in authority. So we want to define shalom as it is, but reality, it becomes vandalized. Sin brought death. It says death through sin. But next, how far does it reach? How far does it reach? How far does the problem reach? Well, look with me in the next section or next verses at the end of 12 and through 14. It says, so death spread to all men because all sin. This is important here. Understand, what do you mean it spread to all men? Let me say this here. Adam, here it is, is a covenantal head. Okay, so what you're going to see here, and I'll foreshadow a little bit of a Christ. You have Adam, who is humanity, who created in God's image, but you also have Christ, who is man, fully God and fully man here. That's why you see at the end of verse 14, it says how Christ, uh, Adam is a type of the one is to come. And so what is happening is that you have this thing called imputing that's taking place because God looks at things corporately, not just individually. And so Adam is the covenantal head of humanity. He is the head representative, and when he disobeyed God, notice it's the text says he, Eve get a bad rap, but God gave the authority, God gave Adam the, the, the say, and he had the responsibility to honor God and honor the one that was with him, namely Eve, and yet he didn't. That's right. That's right. Eve always get a bad rap, but it was God who gave, it was Adam who God told, don't touch or eat of the tree of good, of knowledge of good and evil. But anyways, what we see here, so how did it spread to all? Because Adam is the covenantal head and representative of humanity. And so the sin became imputed to humanity. The same way that righteousness is imputed to us because Christ represents the spiritualness of who we are in the body and he makes us righteous, as we will see in the text, not ourselves. So when it says that death spread to all, and get this, and it said all sinned. Uh-oh. What you mean all sin? But then the Bible is very clear. How many of you all know you can't escape God? You, you, you can't escape God because the Bible tells us here, it said that even where there was no law, sin was very present still. From Adam, from Adam to Moses. Why did he say that? Because you got to remember, they didn't have the law. They didn't get the law until Moses went up to the mountain and got on the tablets and gave them to him. But we see that sin had its effect. Why? Because God flooded the earth because it was wicked. We see that he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because there was wickedness. And what it is saying and what it's trying to get us to understand here is this, that death is so great and sin was so powerful that no one could escape its dominion. Even though the law shows us how we're missing the mark and shows us what it is, how our brokenness and how holy God is, even though it wasn't there, sin was so powerful, you could not escape his dominion. But notice in the text, it talks about how it even says, though, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those, here it is, whose sinning was not like Adam. This idea of death reign, it uses, it was a ruler, it was a master. It became our master. And if you are not a believer to hear today, I'm, I, I, I want to be honest with you, death is your master. 
If you're not a believer, death is not your master. Christ is. But understand this, when we talk about death reign, what do you mean by death? There was physical death. There was this um, physical dying as that, 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 that takes place. There was a decay. We know that there is a decay because if you keep growing and living, you, your body don't function like it used to. Even though when I look at these young bucks and I think I can outrun them and I think I got some football moves, I'm reminded real quick when I make that, oh, hold up, hold up, player. <laughs> That, that them knees ain't like they used to be no more. The body is decaying. <laughs> but also we have the spiritualness that is taking place. There's spiritual death. There's been this separation from God, this disruption in the shalom that we were created to be with him. So when I talk about death, reign, and spirit, that's what we're talking about. But here's what's very interesting. The text said that it said that Pretty much it was saying that sin, everyone's sin, even though their transgressions was not like Adam. You see, we really good at saying, I don't sin like them. Well, surely, God, my sin is actually fine. I'm, mm, you know, God, I ain't, I, ain't, I ain't sleeping with, I ain't messing with, I'm not stealing from the job. I'm, you know, God, my attitude ain't like yeah, I know it's a little off the chain, but you get what I'm saying. We sit here and think that, we, 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 that we're in our transgressions is not as bad. But do you know what the word transgression means? It, here's what it means. It means, in its original language, it means to overstep. It is to go beyond. And what happened with Adam and Eve did, they overstepped and went beyond what God had put in place. And so the reality is that you and I do the very same thing. We know God in his word and what he has said has put things in place for us. We know what his word says. We know how we ought to live and how we ought to conduct ourselves. We should at least. But what happens is as we go, no, I don't want to do that. We overstep and beyond what he says and not do. Here it is. What he even says. You overstep when you don't live within the rules of what God has created. And hear me, family of God, stop believing what the culture tells you. Stop believing the enemy that thinking that what God has for you is not good. Just because you don't get to indulge in your flesh in what seems to be pleasant doesn't mean that God is withholding from you. But we need to lament those things. Lament when we overstep. Lament when we, <laughs> when, we, when we think that we didn't do anything wrong and someone tells us that we did wrong. Let us be humble enough and lament the fact that we have, we have failed to love and honor an image bearer that is before us. But let me say something here. Here's what happened when we overstep what Adam and Eve does. What we do, we try harder. When we realize that we have overstepped God, when we have went beyond him and we uh, realize, you know how it is, you realize, uh oh, I'm in trouble. This isn't good. We try harder. We do exactly what Adam and Eve did. How did they try harder? They put fig leaves over themselves. How did they try harder? They hid themselves. How did they try harder? Because they blamed someone else. Because the reality of it is, is that we do the same thing. We do the same thing. We sit here and we take our proverbial leaves and what do we do? We try to cover ourselves. And not only if we don't try to cover ourselves, we try to hide. Thinking that if I just come to church enough, if I go to formation group enough, if I do the religiosities of my faith, then and only then God hmm, won't see Maybe he'll just forget. And, and then we also place the blame game, right? Listen, we just try harder. And what happens in our trying harder, what we're doing is trying to figure out a solution to the problem that we caused. But how many of you all know what happens is that when trying harder to figure out a solution, you realize your solution does not run deep enough. The, the solution to try to fix things on your own. It doesn't run as far as the curse is found. In fact, it comes up short. And you're reminded when it comes up short because anything that we try to touch and do within our own realm and power, it may look like it's okay in the moment. But if you keep on living and you keep on experiencing those things, you go, this is just getting more worse but we should lament the fact that we overstepped. 
we should lament the fact that has taken place. And get this, even creation, creation acknowledges the depth to a degree, the depth of its brokenness. Because if you look at Romans chapter eight, you don't have to turn now, but Romans chapter eight, and particularly verse 19 and 23, it talks about how creation groans because of sin. Even creation laments that it's not what it is supposed to be. You see, Christ comes in as far as the curse is found, not just as far as the curse is found into humanity, not as far as the curse is found in your family, not as far as the curse is found in your church or at your job. No, it comes to find, he comes to cover all aspects of creation that is his, not just ourselves but we have to be willing to lament. We can't live in this illusion. We can't downplay the, 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 the sin that we do because how many of you all know we just wanna just go ahead and sweep it under the rug? Surely that ain't that big of a deal. Let me tell you, family of God, lament. But oftentimes some of us, if I'm honest, we lament without hope. We lament as if we're defeated. Yeah. <laughs> and if I'm, and, and let's just be real. Sometimes we forget that we have hope, especially for believers, because we're so consumed with the brokenness in front of us, with the real pains, with the real hurt, that we forget that there is a solution. We forget there is one that can heal but all we're so fixated on, hear me, I'm not trying to downplay the brokenness. When someone sins and gets you, it hurts. We're not here to, 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 pontific, to pontificate on, on the matters or whatever the case may be. What happens is that where people are at, there will be mess and there will be brokenness, whether intentions or unintentional. And we need to lament those things. And I submit to you today, sometimes we're really good. Think about it. We're beautiful. If you look at the world sometimes, especially in, the culture, in, our, in our country, when devastating things happen, 9-11, we came together, we lament. When you see what's happened over country, overseas, regardless of your political views, listen, you, you lament because there's humanity that is being affected by it. But one place I believe that we like to, get this, that we like to just downplay it and we don't sit in it enough is within ourselves because oftentimes we think we're better than what we are. God calls us to lament not only the world, but also the brokenness in here. But I submit to you, as we've seen how, where the problem's from, where the problem come from, how far the problem has reached. Now let's go into the hope that we have. How was the problem dealt with? How was this problem dealt with? What happens now, which you see between verse 15 and really to the end of this chapter in verse 21, you see this contrast, not comparison. This is very important. A contrast different. You see that it talks about one man's trespasses versus one man's righteousness. And what Paul is trying to show them and even us now how the problem can be dealt with. And he's showing the difference of the one who is able to actually fix the solution that we, that we desperately long for. But we have to be honest with what we see here in the text because the first thing that he does is he says, he says here, the free gift is not like. So really what happens is there's about five or six contrasts that you will see here. But he says the free gift is not like what? The one man's trespass. For many died through that. But notice here the language of abundance and much more. The text says much more. When you see that much more, that is an emphatic. That is saying great and even greater because it's trying to show us that Jesus is the greater solution to the brokenness that we have. So he says this free gift, don't get lost on the free gift. Who don't like something free? If anybody say they don't like nothing, something free, they lying. It just all depends on what you like that is free. But it says, here it is, the free gift is better and it's different. It says because as one man's trespass, it brought what? What happened? It brought bondage. It brought chaos. It brought a disruption. It, broke, um, it, it brought a, a brokenness in the action. 
access that we had to the Father, namely God here. But verses, the text says that he's much more, here it is in verse 15, much more have the grace of God, the free gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. This idea of much more, what does that mean? Much more freedom, true freedom, peace. True hope in a future now, but also in eternity and in access that you and I get to a holy God. Because there's a free gift that has paved that way, that has mended that brokenness for us and that we live in that already and not yet. But notice it talks about as we keep walking, it's not like the free gift is not like the trespass because there's different results. We says that when you keep looking at verse 15, uh, 16, the free gift is not like the results of the one man's sin. Why? Judgment followed one trespass and brought condemnation. That's what it is because God, has a, God is a holy God and he has to deal with it. Let me say this here. When you sin, when we sin intentionally or unintentionally, do not think, and let me speak to especially intentionally, do not think for one minute because you may not have experienced the consequence of that sin that you got away with it. God has to deal with sin. He has to, but we have a holy God as we're seeing here in the text who is much more and greater than our sins. So it's not that you've gotten away with your sins. It's just that somebody went and paid your debt for that sin. So don't think for a minute that when you indulge in what you did, ooh, that ain't that bad. I got away with it. That ain't, let me try that again. Don't you do that. Don't you do that. Don't tempt God. Don't test God, as the Bible say. Don't do that. But we see here, it says judgment came and brought condemnation. But we also see that, oh, I love this here. Praise God. It says the free gift, my Lord. Yeah. The free gift. Listen, listen, get this, get this. Followed many of the trespass yeah. and brought justification. What are you saying, Pastor? The act of Christ, by Christ, by heaven coming into earth. God in the flesh became obedient to everything, even unto death. And what did he do? It says that his act followed many trespasses, which means all of the sins of the whole world. This is how powerful and much more our God is of the world. That means as much as life has been living before us, his act followed all the millions and billions of people who has gone before us and who is present now and who it is to come. His, get this, his act of goodness and righteousness followed all of the many transgressions. And let me just be honest, it could just stop with me because I got many. But it says that and it led to what? Justification, meaning you got to quit it. That means that you got acquitted that when you stand before the God and the accuser of the brother and said, hey, listen, look what they have done. And God says, my blood is covered over them. Not guilty. Next. Which that's it. That's the beauty of the gift. That's the beauty of the gift here. But also when you look into the text, keep in mind, look what happens here. In verse 17, it says, if the if for if because one man's trespassing, here it is. Death reign. If you notice, you'll see a lot of languages that repeat of death reign. Death was spread. And then you see here in these uh, verse 15, 19, much more. Or you see the word abundantly or whatever version it is because we're starting, God, they're trying to say something to how, how serious this was. It says death reigned through one man, but much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life. Let me say this here. Death reigns. And so if you're like, well, I'm a believer. Now. Okay, so death doesn't reign over me. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Death is pursuing you. It's crouching at your door. Death comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And if you look at places like Romans chapter 13, verse 14, you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, it says, don't give an opportunity for the enemy or for the, for the evil one to seize you. Another way I like to say it is that don't take the bait of the enemy because he's going to put it out there. It's just like rat poison. It looks good, but that 1% is super deadly. It rains over us 
or excuse me, for the non-believer, it definitely reigns. It's your master. You ain't got no choice but to obey it. But then if you're the believer, you go, but why do I keep wanting to do that? Because the enemy is in pursuit. Sin has that effect on us, but we don't have to give into it because the text tells us that death reigned. But if you receive the gift, which is hard for us to do, it says that you will reign in life. Get this, not in you, but in Jesus. That should be freeing for you and I. Because as we try to fix the solution, we realize that we can't do that at all. But God offers this free gift, heaven coming to earth. As far as the curse is found, it says that you have to receive the gift here. I want you to understand something. Let me say this here. This is not a universalism passage. Okay. This is not meaning that because sin entered into the world, all therefore was imputed uh, as sinners. And because Christ came in, therefore all now there are made righteous, but they just have to be aware of the fact that they were made righteous. That's not true. We don't believe in a universalism salvific. The Bible doesn't talk about universalism in any way. Notice the text says that those who receive, you have to receive. Just like you're going to receive here in about three weeks, a gift that someone, gets this, has gotten you, whether you've verbalized it or not. We live in a time where people, where people here in a couple of weeks, you're going to receive. season. She loves everything. I'm like, oh, I don't need nothing like that. And I remember the one time in in my mind, I didn't even get nothing. But really, I'm I'm over here thinking like, man, if I don't get nothing, there's going to be a problem up in here. (laughs) I'm like, listen, I better get something up in here. You hear me? I'm paying these bills and lights and something better happen. (laughs) Listen, I'm just being real. Man, let me tell you something. But man, when I get a gift from her, It's beautiful because even if I can't articulate, oh, help me, Holy Spirit, let me make it plain. Even if I can't articulate what I really want, she knows me enough to know what I would want and like. And we have a God that is the same way. He knows what we need. He knows what we not only need, but also want. And he's given it to us in Christ. But you and I have to receive it. You have to receive it. You don't sit here and get the gift from someone that they've given you that you desired and that you want. And then all of a sudden you say, no, you can keep it. No, you want that. You cherish that. But guess what? Our earthly gifts that we get from people, it diminishes us. Um, Excuse me. It, it, It decays and we lose interest and we want the next thing. But the free gift, the free gift, the abundant gift, my Lord, listen to me. That's not the case. It doesn't decay. It doesn't run dry. In fact, it keeps flowing. But the question is, will you receive it? Will you admit and lament your brokenness and the problems? Remember what I said earlier, if you want to be healed, there needs to be a recognition that we, in order to be desperately healed, that a recognition of the source and the depths of our problem. Don't lie to yourself, but receive the gift that Christ has given to us. This idea to receive is to hold, is to experience it. And let me say this here. Let me say this here. Yes, you once you're saved, I believe in the Bible when true conversion happened because the Bible, how it reads, once you're saved, always saved. Hear me, hear me now. Listen, get this. But this idea of receive is in a verb, is in part, is a present, and it's a participle, meaning that you got to receive it more than once. That doesn't mean that you keep getting saved every time you repent your sins. That's not what it's saying. But you need to receive the gospel every day. You need to pick up the cross and acknowledge your brokenness, lament what happened last night, lament what happened a month ago, a year ago, and receive the gospel, rest in it every day. Because when your two feet hit the ground, the enemy has said, baby, it's go time. And when you receive the gift, you're receiving something powerful that's bigger and that can help address the source of the problem, namely the gospel. But the text goes on to tell us, even in verse 19, the disobedience of Adam brought made us Eighteen. Listen to God's word. It says, "For Christ suffered once for sins, and the unrighteous—excuse oh, me—the righteous him for the unrighteous, 
that he might bring us to God, putting death, putting to death the flesh and made alive in the spirit. The righteous for the unrighteous. Family of God, hear me, and I hope this frees you. You don't have and you cannot make yourself righteous. But the beauty, of this se- the beauty of this season is to remind us that there is a gift who can and does make us righteous. The righteous for the unrighteous to put away death and make us alive here. So I submit to you today, receive that gift. Whatever it is that you're trying to hold, put that down and receive the gift that is able to heal the problem, namely Jesus. Aslam is on the move. Aslam is on the move and he will shake his mane. In the Chronicles of Narnia, there's a, there's Mr. Beaver who takes place and talking to the children. And Mr. Beaver is at dinner trying to explain to them a few things. And he's letting them know how the white witch, who is the illegitimate ruler of Nardia, and talks about how this, 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 this illegitimate ruler will turn those who visit into stones. And Mr. Beaver is letting them know, hey, there's really nothing we can do. There's nothing that we can do to actually dethrone this white witch here um, in Narnia. But how many of you all know Aslam is on the move? You see, so what does that mean? Does that mean that, that, that what does that mean for Aslam? Well, well, she won't in any way turn him into stone, will she? As he goes on to, to articulate, here's what Mr. Beaver tells them. He says, Mr. Beaver says, the Lord loves you, son of Adam. What a simple thing to say. Turn him into stones? (laughs) If she can stand on her two feet and look him in the face, it'll be the most she can do and more than I expect her to. No, no. He'll put all things right as it says in a hymn, in an old hymn in this part. Wrongs will be right when Aslam come in sight at the sound of his roar. Sorrow will be no more. And when he bears his teeth, winter will meet its death. When he shakes his mane, there shall, we shall have spring again. Family of God, there is another line I want to tell you about in Revelation chapter 5. Help me, Holy Spirit. Let me not get too happy here. There's another lion that will shake his mane. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. See, just like in Nardia, devastation hit them and they were, that, 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 that winter was messing them up. And the same way happens in our world. Devastation has affected everything. Sin has wrecked everything. And just like them in Nardia, they too, guess this, we too long to be healed from the effects of sin and death. And in this Advent season, it is a reminder to to you and I that the, that the line of the tribe of Judah is on the move. When he, looked, when he came down onto earth and was in that manger into Bethlehem, the line of the tribe of Judah began to shake his mane. Listen, when he lived a sinless life and obeyed all that God has done, the line of the tribe of Judah began to shake his mane. When he went to face death up on Calvary's hill, he looked at death and death thought they claimed one more victim Yet, what happened? The lion of tribe of Judah shakes his mane. And when they laid him in that borrowed tomb and he laid in that grave all day Friday, but early Sunday morning, the lion of the tribe of Judah began to shake his mane. And when he rose again on that third day, he looked at death and he stared it in his face and he sat here and realized and broke the bondage of sin and death. Why? Because the lion of tribe of Judah began to shake his main family of God. I'm here to tell you he's coming back again. He came once and he is coming back again. How do you all know that? Because here's what we know, man. My Bible says that when the line of the tribe of Judah shakes his mane once and for all, death shall be no more. Mourning shall be no more. Injustice shall be no more. Pain shall be no more. Hurt shall be no more. Why? Because when he shakes that mane once and for all, the line of the tribe of Judah will say, behold, I make all things new. Family our king is on the move. And that's what this season reminds us about. 
how he came through, broke into humanity as far as the curse is found. But what is the problem? What do we have to do? We have to receive the gift. We have to acknowledge the gift. We have to acknowledge that he will shake his mane. He will make all things right. And I know it feels hopeless at times. I know it feels defeated. I know sometimes we feel crushed, but we got to hold on to the fact of Christ is better than the sorrow that we have. If you keep reading Romans chapter five, it even says where sin is, grace abounds all the more. The curse, the sin cannot, out, cannot outdo God's grace. 